All right. Today we'll be covering a subject where it is a, still a very debatable topic. It has been debated for uh, over a thousand years, and it is a heresy. But a lot of Christians have accepted it as just a simple minor doctrine. But we're still brothers, we can get along. No, we consider this as heresy, and we also consider this as an enemy of Bible-believing truth. And that doctrine is Calvinism. So, in this basic doctrine study, and you might say, isn't Calvinism apologetics? Isn't that a topic that should be something deep? Well, in basic doctrines, what we're covering is, you might recall, different subjects in theology. It's impossible that theology will not come across the subject of Calvinism. That's why we have to address this topic, but it can be covered in an easy format. It's not the five points of Calvinism per se, but the one that's debated upon, which is why Calvinism was born. The sovereignty of God. That's why Calvinism is born. So a Bible believer, when they study the subject of sovereignty, they have to see what the Bible says about it. Calvinists, they will insist that sovereignty is a Bible study, uh, is a Bible topic, and there are verses for it. And their favorite line of argument is, I want to see your verses to prove sovereignty. And what is shocking to me is that some so-called apologetic scholars who are against Calvinism cannot pull up verses to prove their point of view related to the sovereignty of God. And my simple answer to that is simply looking at the Calvinist verses themselves culminated with free will verses. It's that simple. And that shows a holistic biblical perspective, not selective biblical perspectives. Calvinists, they select biblical verses yes. to prove their point of view, but they don't look at the whole thing. So we're holistic here. And this study will give all the verses, including the Calvinist verses. And we're only covering the sovereignty of God right here. We're covering the sovereignty of God, which is a Calvinist topic. And we're going to point out that the Calvinists misunderstood his sovereignty. Now, number one, for Calvinists to think that there are so many verses on sovereignty, guess what? There is not one single verse, believe it or not, that says sovereign or sovereignty in the Bible. It is absolutely not mentioned at all. Isn't that funny? Now, do you know where sovereign is mentioned, believe it or not? If you're a King James only person, then you Calvinists are okay then. Because in the preface of the King James Bible, it says uh, it addresses the king as the sovereign. So Calvinists should be King James only. In other words, if you are a Calvinist and you are an ESV type of person and not King James only, then you are totally anti-biblical because <laughs> you have no support whatsoever on sovereignty. We King James only people have at least one mention on sovereignty <laughs> because we believe in the King James Bible. Isn't that funny? Okay. Anyways, seriously, however, even though the word is not mentioned, there is an idea here. But this idea is still not supporting the Calvinist idea of sovereignty. So the idea is this. The word sovereign simply means the supreme right to do what he wants with his own. The supreme right to do what he wants with his own. Now Calvinists, I probably say, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, because Calvinists always accuse their opponents, opponents of misunderstanding or mislabeling. So they're going to do the same thing with me. And I'll be honest with you, I don't care. Not because I don't desire the truth, because even if I give the truth, they'll still accuse me of mislabeling them. I know those Calvinist trolls, okay? They're very dishonest people. Now there are good, honest Calvinists there and who are even King James only too. So I am fair, and I know those people. But generally, Calvinists give a bad testimony of being trolls and accusing their opponents of mislabeling. 
So because of that, you guys have a bad testimony. So when I say Calvinists uh, are rash accusers and they'll just simply accuse me of mislabeling them, then that's pretty much a general truth because that's the testimony they give out. So they got a lot of work to fix their testimony. They have a horrible testimony of being prideful, accusing people of not understanding them, and they give the impression they're more knowledgeable than them. So then when I give that impression against them, then they accuse me of being prideful. Funny, right? Funny. I play on their playground, and they don't like that. See? How does that feel, Calvinist? I mean, you guys did the same thing. Just because you bully people and then you can enjoy all that power, when somebody else bullies you, then you play the victim, don't you? All right, anyway, enough, uh, enough uh, criticizing against them. Let's get to Scripture. Amen. Two passages which are pretty famous, <coughs> Daniel chapter 4 and Revelation 4. Daniel 4 is perhaps one of the most favorite passages for Calvinists, or at least some Calvinists. And Revelation 4 is actually one of probably the Bible believers' favorite passages. One of the most favorites. Because we definitely agree with Revelation chapter 4. It's a good verse. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. What well, must be understood that the most important thing in life is the glory of God, that what we are created to do is to please Him. That is the ultimate aspiration, what we're supposed to do in life is to please Him, is to follow His will, it's for His glory. Everything else is not as important compared to the glory of God. So, believe it or not, we do agree with the Calvinists on that one. But they elevate His glory to the point where they make Him evil, where they make Him actually weak, where they even take away His sovereignty. And we will demonstrate that. First of all, Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, the Bible says, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and He doeth according to His will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay His hand, or say unto Him, What doest thou? Revelation 4.11 Revelation 4.11 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Matthew chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 5. From these two verses we have seen that the glory of man or their feelings or what they want is not as important compared to God. It is irrelevant compared to the glory of God. God's glory is the most important in life. So every other king or prince or people's feelings, it is irrelevant. It is not as highly prioritized compared to the glory of God. We are for His glory. So in Matthew chapter 20, and verse 9 through 15, it's not a matter of fair versus unfair. It's a matter of what God wants to do with His own. That should be prioritized. Chapter 20, verse 9 through 15. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a, pain, a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. See, that's unequal. That's unfair. Here's a group of workers who have worked fewer hours compared to the first workers who worked longer hours. But they get the same pay. So that is totally unfair. Verse 13, But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto the last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So notice right here, God can do whatever He wants with His own. 
so your feelings are irrelevant right here. Now, this does not mean that God is unfair. This does not mean that God, he lets evil things happen because he wants to and he could care less about your feelings. You will notice in this same passage that even though God can do what he wants with his own, and it's not a matter of fair versus unfair, that he is fair. He said right here, didn't you agree with me on this term right here? Here's another one. He mentioned that he's good just because your eye is evil, but he is still good. So it does not diminish in any way or form of the goodness of God, the love of God. See that? That's what Calvinists miss out. So we believe in elevating the glory of God, but we dare not diminish his love. We also elevate his love. If they accuse us of elevating his love more than his glory, no, that's the wrong argument. We elevate his glory just as much as his love. Why? Because that's who God is, and every single one of his attributes should be 100% elevated. That's the difference with us and Calvinists. So see right here that uh, we are better than the Calvinists because we, uh, we, pro uh, we glorify the entire attributes of God, not just one. Now go to Matthew 5, verse 45. 545. The Bible says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh this sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. You will notice right here, which is very true in life, it doesn't matter if you live good or you live evil. Uh, bad things happen to everybody and good things happen to everybody. Life is unfair. Life is unfair, and things happen that way. Why? Because God can do what he wants with his own. Now, I know that it sounded a little contradictory to what I said earlier about his love, his kindness, and stuff like that, but those will be answered later on. Because unfair scenarios that happen to good people, it still turns out to be fair because God makes sure, makes sure to pay them back. See? God makes sure it's to turn them into God. And evil people who have good things in life, they do get punished in the end. See, so overall, God still turns out to be fair. But it still supports the argument that unfair things do happen. So rather than a contradiction, it's just a full truth. It's just a full perspective you need to look at. All right, now let's look at Job 1. Job chapter 1. Now, no matter how much is taken from you, God has the right to take it back. And we might say, oh God, why did this bad thing happen? Lord, you're just so mean, that is totally unfair. Well, you know what you've got to do? You're not elevating his sovereignty, what rightfully belongs to him. If there's a good point of the Calvinist against us, it's this. It's that we do focus more on picking on his love rather than his glory. Now that's a problem on your part, not God's part. Not Bible-believing truth and Bible-believing doctrine. That's your fleshly part that made the mistake right there, that the Calvinists are right about. Now go to Job chapter 1 and verse 21. Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away, yet you still glorify him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. In other words, it should be taken as common sense that, listen, no matter how much is taken away from you, God is still God and can do whatever he wants. It's your part, servant, it's your part, subject, to let him take the full glory or you want him to submit to yours. See? So you have to seriously think about his sovereignty here. Now let's talk about the extent of his sovereignty. The extent of his sovereignty. First of all, go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. 
And then there are three verses that I want you to write down. We're not going to turn to all of them because we're going to be more biblical than the Calvinists. So we're going to give you all the verses. Okay? First things first is Deuteronomy 10.14. Write them down. Deuteronomy 10.14. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. And the last one is Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16. Now, we're going to look at only one of them, Deuteronomy 10, verse 14. This next section is the extent of sovereignty. Extent of sovereignty. And then the first one that we previously covered is the meaning of sovereignty. That's what we covered, the meaning of sovereignty. In other words, his glory is important. Your feelings are irrelevant. We've got to give him the ultimate glory. We understood its meaning. Now we're going to cover the extent of it, and it is very extent. He can do whatever he wants with his own. The first one is the universe. The first one is the universe. And before we continue on, this is a very good one where you can actually realize that your feelings are irrelevant and uh, they actually hurt you. Your feelings hurt you. Your feelings would be better if you let him be truly sovereign. So you'll notice right here our responsibility, things I must do to honor God. A lot of times the reason why your feelings are hurt is that you put the responsibility on you. But you've got to let God be God and let those other things go. Things I have concerns about but cannot control. God's responsibility. Other people's responses and things that are going on in your family. They're outside of your control. So when we, I like this part, when we attempt to control what is God's responsibility, it results in anxiety, frustration, and disappointment. See that? So the reason why your feelings are hurt is not because of God's fault. It's because you're not letting God be God. You're trying to be God. So that will be extremely helpful in your life. Amen. And I'll be honest, that did help me quite often. But you know what my feelings, my flesh want? It wants to take control. Right. It wants its own terms of receiving comfort. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I'll never get peace with God. Until I let God be God and let Him do what He wants, then I get more peace that way. Even if it's something that my flesh does not like, I still get the feeling of peace when I crucify that flesh. All right. Now, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 14, the universe is under the control of God. Behold the heaven, and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's. Thy God, the earth also, with all that therein is. So notice that everything in the universe belongs to God. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Three verses again. Verse 26. Verse 26. And then the second one is Psalm 105, verse 16. Psalm 105, 16. The third one is Jeremiah 14, verse 22. Jeremiah 14, verse 22. The second one is nature. The second one is nature. Let's look at verse 26 of Psalm 78. He caused, an e he, oh, excuse me. he caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. So everything that's going on in the weather and... Uh, what we're going through in this uh, life when there's hurricanes, lightning, thunder, sunny day, bad days. It's all under the control of God. He is in control. All right, to make things uh, easier to everybody, I'm going to write out the verses. That way it will be simplified for everybody on the extent of God's sovereignty here. We saw one, his universe. I'm not going to write the verses on those since you already wrote them down. The second one is his nature, or in other words, the nature of the world. That's what I meant. The third one is vegetation. The third one is vegetation. Uh, the verses are Matthew 6.30. Matthew 6.30. The second one is... 
21 verse 19, 21 verse 19. is Jonah 4.6. Jonah 4.6. Alright, the fourth one is nations. Nations. So when a flower dies, that's under God's control. See that? So God is still in charge. He's still on the throne. Literally everything in life, even the smallest blade of grass that somebody stepped upon. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. That's your God. The nations are under the control of God. So Job 12, 23. Job 12, 23. The second one is Daniel 4, 25. Daniel 4, 25. And the third one is Romans 13. Romans 13, 1 through 2. Romans 13, 1 through 2. It's easy to get upset at politics and politicians and world leaders, but we keep forgetting that God is still on the throne. And he's the one ultimately in control. Including when they have done the evil, the politicians. It, God is still God and he gave the politicians that this nation had chosen, believe it or not. Why? Because the nations deserved it. Life. The fifth one is life. Job chapter 12 verse 10. Job chapter 12 and verse 10. Luke 12 20. Luke chapter 12 and verse 20. The third one is uh, John 21, 22. John 21, 22. So when people die early or people live longer, God is the one who counts their years. And God is the one who says, hey, you come up to heaven or you live longer. Mankind. So humanity itself. That's the sixth one. The verses are Exodus 4.11. Exodus 4.11. Proverbs 20.24. Proverbs 20.24. And then Romans 9. Favorite Calvinist passage. Romans 9.18 and 20. Romans 9.18 and 20. In other words, everything that we decide or the things that we do in life, it's still not going to overthrow his sovereignty. He's still going to make sure that his plan is fulfilled no matter what mankind does. Amen. The last one is all things. All things. Why? Because they're for his glory. All things for his glory. And that is given in so many verses. Isaiah 46. So let's go through all these verses. Isaiah chapter 46. Verse 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11. Second one is John 11, 4. John chapter 11, verse 4. Uh, third one is 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 6 through 7. 6 through 7. The next one is Ephesians chapter 1. This is another favorite Calvinist passage. Ephesians 1, 9 through 11. Ephesians 1, 9 through 11. All right. If you all didn't catch up, then uh, it's all written out over there for you. Now, this is... Now, uh, excuse me. These are the passages that the Calvinists will agree upon. And that the Calvinists love and adore because they focus solely on the sovereignty of God. Now, we're holistic. We're not selective. So in order to be holistic, we're going to even give out the Calvinist verses. And these verses cannot be denied. He is sovereign. He is in charge, including when mankind chooses to do things that they want to do. He'll make sure that his plan is fulfilled and he's still on the throne and he's still in charge. So that is our God because that's how sovereign he is over everything. Now, here's the interesting part that people will disagree with. But before I show that part, let's give you uh, the picture right here. Uh, what we demonstrated from all these examples, God must be sovereign because of his attributes and characteristics. See, all these things is, makes up who he is. So the universe that he created, all of nature, vegetation, nations, life, mankind, all things for his glory. So everything undergoes his plan, what he wants to do. That's how he created everything. But now comes the issue of, okay, if he created everything that he wanted it to be done his way, 
then why are there too many verses that show people contradicting what God wants? Are you saying then that God wants genocide, that God wants murder? If you are dumb James White, then you're going to say yes, all right? He acts smart, he talks smart, but he's actually very dumb inside. He cloaks it with smart words, okay? It's pretty obvious. But anyway, that's not the right answer. And White will say that I'm uh, putting him out of context. I could care less, all right? Even if I give the whole truth, he'll still accuse me putting him out of context. Returning to the topic right here is that what do we do with these issues? Because people, obviously, when they sin, Bible believers disagree that that is under God's will. What must be understood is this. Now we're going to come to what sounds contradictory, but it's not contradictory. Again, it's holistic. We're looking at the full truth here. Sometimes when you go to full truth, things seem contradictory. Yeah, that's right. All right? That's why people don't like that, so they go by selective truth. The easiest example that Calvinists would even agree with is actual scientific phenomena in the Bible where there are verses that seem to contradict each other. <laughs> but we do know that it's not contradictory. It's just being holistic. It's just being honest with you. And then when we look at the holistic or full context, the full perspective, then we understand better. We're like, oh, okay, that's what it means, all right? Okay, now, returning back uh, to the subject right here, limits of sovereignty, not just extent, but limits. And that does sound contradictory, because when we cover the limits of God's sovereignty, that does not mean that he is all in control, okay? Uh, you, know, you want the easy answer? Okay, the easy answer is this. God can do whatever he wants, correct? He is all sovereign. He can do whatever he wants with his own, including the free choices of man, the universe, nature, and everything, right? All right, here's, it's more simple than you, you think, okay? God wants everyone to have free will. There you go. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Was that so deep for you? Why do you have to give 100 pages long and write a doctorate thesis on what free will really means and what uh, the sovereignty of God really means, and then you go through semantics and philosophical quotes and sayings and terminologies and theological terminologies. I was going to show you a chart on that, but I didn't want you to because it will just make you go like, are these guys stupid? Why would you do that? That's what happens when you become a Calvinist, yes. a theologian who corrects the Bible, who doesn't believe in taking the word as it says, because your mind is smarter than God. Wow. Okay? Yeah. Make up so many d stupid wordings. Hard determinism, determinism, uh, compatibilism, incompatibilism, libertarian free will, and versus free will itself, and, you know, open theism. Just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> That's all... My, made up terms yeah. that are not even in the word of God. God never even said those terms. Right. Not even sovereignty. Thank God. <sighs> I wouldn't have got saved. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you, brother. <laughs> I, I understand those atheists when they accuse Christians. Yeah. If you go by Calvinist logic. Yeah. Isn't God cruel then with all this suffering and evil going on in this world if he truly is God and he made sure that everything goes accordingly to his will, even the suffering and, your, and the choices that you made in doing evil and God's will is aligned with that one? See, that's very, you're making God very evil right yes, here. Yes. When we say God is still in charge in spite of man's evil going on, that does not mean that his will is in sync of, I want genocide and murder to happen. No, that's the wrong focus. The simple answer is, God just wants everybody to have free will rather than being robots. That's all you have to focus on. But when you're going into further detail, like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, then that means, what about genocide? What about murder? And no, 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 no. God wants to keep things simple, stupid. He just wants everyone to have free will. That's all he wants. That's why it's interesting that there are some verses that points out that God didn't even think about some of the wicked deeds that sinners did. Yes. Why? He wants to keep things simple, stupid. 
He's not thinking about like genocide and Adolf Hitler and all that kind of stuff. He's not like trying to get into so deep that, oh yeah, the, exactly, I want that thing to happen. He just doesn't, when it comes to those kind of things, he just wants to keep things simple. Yes. Am I limiting his foreknowledge, his all knowledge? No, I'm not doing that. All right, God knows everything, including every detail and sinful action that mankind has committed. But that does not mean that he was thinking about, I want that specific thing to happen. No, if you have a child, don't you want babies with free will? Yes, you want a baby with free will. But are you thinking about that, I want my child to commit murder right here and do all this kind of stuff? If you were God throughout all eternity, you simply want people with free choice to love you and to serve you. Okay, why do you have to get deep? All right? Why do you have to get deep? Sometimes uh, just simple things to think about will get rid of all the complicated and, and all the complicated philosophical arguments, examples, analogies, and all this kind of complicated mess. Yeah, all right, enough of that. Yada, yada, yada. Let's keep things simple, stupid, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Genesis 1. And then verse 31. The first thing we have to understand is the existence of sin. The existence of sin. Now, I keep uh, shooting off my mouth. The reason why is because of my opponents. And this is not a thorough uh, ex explanation against Calvinism. So if you're going to be very honest and disprove me, rather than just concentrating on this video, go to the one where I thoroughly cover it, okay? Simple, go to my playlist called Calvinism in my YouTube channel, all right? It's that simple. All right, now the first thing right here, because this is a basic doctrine. If you think you wrong over this basic doctrine, that shows how basic you are. <laughs> You're not that smart. <laughs> okay, uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, the existence of sin is the first thing that we see the limitation. Notice right here that God did not create sin because he created everything to be good. The Bible points out in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, notice that he's not sovereign where I created everything including the sin to happen. No, he did not. He created everything good. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was what? Very good. Nothing sinful. <coughs> Romans 5.12, Romans 5.12, who brought the evil into the world. It's not God, it's mankind. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Notice that we are the ones responsible. And because of that, that's the reason why sufferings occur. Sufferings occur because of sin. And sin occurs not because of God, but because of us. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All right, now here are interesting things that you want to note because of the existence of sin. Now look how this works with God's sovereignty, okay? God is still God, and He's still in control. How does He do that? With the free choice you make about sin. How he does that is first, he wants everyone to have free will. So then everybody has a responsibility of doing good and evil. And then if you decide, I want to do good, then what's going to happen is, then God is going to make sure that in his control, the free choices that you make in doing good, that his will and purpose and plan will be fulfilled. If you decide out of your free choice, I'm going to do evil, he's going to make sure that his plan and his purpose will still be fulfilled. You know what the simple answer is? God is so sovereign, if you were to, no matter what free choice you make, his plan is fulfilled. Amen. So we're more extreme in Calvinism than the Calvinists. Because Calvinists think God is so weak that God has to make sure that you don't have free will, but that every choice you make has to go with how he's doing uh, the decisions you make in evil or in good. 
he's that weak. No, why not make God so strong in his sovereignty and power, it doesn't matter what you freely think or do, his plan will still be fulfilled. Yeah. Aren't we more extreme Calvinists than the Calvinists then? How nonsensical of them. How does that work? It's simple. So one, God can make sin become worse. So Romans 1, 21 and 24, which we won't turn to. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 24. That's the reason why you notice in some verses how God was involved in making the sin worse for somebody. It's not because God wanted the person to become evil, like he hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? What does harden mean? The reason why he hardened is because the heart already chose to sin. So, see this again. Once mankind makes the choice, God's involvement and plan is still undergoing. See that? That's what makes him sovereign through the free choice that you make. The second one is God can prevent sin to happen. He can prevent sin to happen. So that's a blessing for some people who have that honesty in their heart. But then, doesn't that mean God takes away their free choice? Uh, the verse is Genesis chapter 20, verse 6. Genesis chapter 20, verse 6. No, the reason why God prevented that sin to happen, you'll notice by context, is because the man had the innocency of the heart. But he was going to unintentionally commit adultery, so God stopped him from doing that. Yeah. See that? So it's because of the free choice, the intention of the heart of that individual to be in with. I mean, think about it. Can't we honestly say as people with free choice, there were scenarios that God prevented us from falling into? Amen. Yeah. yeah. All right, that doesn't mean our free choice was taken away. All right, C is God can determine the limits of Satan's attack. God can determine the limits of Satan's attack. So, when sin exists... And Satan says, okay, now I, I'm in charge and I can let suffering happen and all that. God makes sure that he's still king and, that's, and he says, yeah, you're in charge, but, but it's got limitations right here because I'm still on the throne. We're too easy to blame God. We've got to realize, no, Satan, he's the second most smart being in the universe. So you've got to realize he can do whatever he wants in this world but thank God that God at least put some kind of limitation there. Well, God is so unfair. No, it's, it's about Satan's right. Why? I mean, even criminals have rights in court. We agree with that. Everybody has a right. Why do we have rights? Because that's how fair the system works. And Satan, he has a right. Why? Because of you, fool. You chose sin. Yes, yes. So you gave Satan the power. You gave Satan the permission. Yes. And God could have just let Satan go free reign hell on you. Yes. But he made sure that that would not happen. That he's still in charge. Alright. Uh, D. God can use sin for his glory. God can use sin for his glory. I go, whoa, you know, that, that does not make sense right there. Well, the thing is this. We have to understand that God, He is still in charge. He is still on the throne, including no matter what free choice mankind makes. You take that as something negative, but actually it should be something positive. Because let's pretend God doesn't get glory out of that, including the sinful choices you make. Yeah. Then can you picture what will happen? Think about it, if God make, doesn't take charge or His glory is not fulfilled through the sinful decisions you make. Do you know how messed up the world will be? Oh, yeah. So God makes sure that in spite of how wicked your sin is, and you make the free choice, I'm going to do this evil thing, God's going to make sure that that free choice that you make will not override or overthrow His divine plan and purpose. That He'll make sure everything will go well. The greatest example is Satan, when he damned the whole world because of our stupidity, and God could have left us alone. But He decided not to and created the most ultimate plan of redemption instead. Amen. 
See that? He created the most ultimate act of love. And because of that act of love, it helps us understand that God does really love us. Without that act of love, how can we really believe in a sacrificial act of love for us, right? Quite often we use the suffering of Jesus Christ as our motivation. See how glorious God used even the greatest sins of mankind? That's something. Isn't our God a genius? That he has the free will undergoing while he is still sovereign. Makes you smarter than the Calvinist today, didn't you? You feel smarter than the Calvinist, right? You know more about God's sovereignty than they do. All right. Uh, another one is God can cleanse away sin. God can cleanse away sin. That's... Uh, Oh, uh, I didn't give you the verses. So, God can determine the limits for Satan's attack. That's Job 1.12. Job 1.12. God can use sin for His glory. Psalm 76 verse 10. Psalm 76 verse 10. And God can cleanse away sin. 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. 1 1 second one is, the second limitation is uh, the free will of man. The free will of man. Okay, let's see right here. The verses are, uh, you want to write down Joshua 15. Joshua 24, verse 15. And also uh, compare that with John 14, 15. John 14, 15. So again, they are Joshua 24, 15, compared with John 14, 15. The second one is the free will of man. God did not force people to serve him because he wanted uh, them to love him out of their free will. And I've explained that before. Those are the two verses you want to use. So, the simple rationale is this. You can't blame God. I mean, can you imagine being in eternity all alone? Can you really picture that? Even the toughest criminals, they can't stand solitary confinement. Do you realize that? So, how can you blame God for creating everyone with free will to love Him? See that? That's why he put free will there. That's why he created us. The first one that we have to understand is God can allow man's will to conflict his will. God can allow man's will to conflict his will. That's 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9. The Second one is God can weep for man's will to follow his will. Weep for man's will to follow his will. That's uh, Matthew 23, 37. Matthew 23, 37. The third one is God can use man's will of sin for his glory. Man's will of sin for his glory. And I explained all that before. But this one is talking about free will, so that's the reason why. And I'll give the one verse here. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. And you will notice that mankind made the free choice there. And so because of that, God's going to use that for his glory. It doesn't mean that he did a robotic thing and forced them to sin. God can let man's will follow Satan's will. God can let man's will follow Satan's will. That's 2 Timothy 2.26. 2 Timothy 2.26. Well, I don't agree with that. Hey, let God be God. Let him do whatever he wants. Simple answer. Calm down. Why do you have to give five paragraphs long of arguments of your disagreement? Let's make it simple. Let God do what he wants. Oh Funny, right? Yeah. God can fashion man's will of righteousness to discover his perfect will. God can fashion man's will of righteousness to discover uh, his perfect will.
See, you make the free choice of doing what's good. So then God's in control over that and shows you his perfect will. Depends on how your heart goes, what you freely decide. That's Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2. All right, third limitation. Third limitation. The privilege of prayer. The privilege of prayer. Think about this, man. Okay. Isn't this something? God can sometimes allow you to pray or ask God for something where he can change what he originally had things undergo. Yeah. That's powerful. God can be influenced by prayer. The evidence is James 5, 16 through 18. James 5, 16 through 18. God can be influenced by prayer. If you don't think so, then uh, why would God even demand us to pray if it's going to happen anyway, right? It's funny. Here these Calvinists argue about prayer. Have them cover topics on prayer. Why even pray anyway if it's going to happen anyway? If God already planned and divinely ordained everything to undergo, why even pray? You know what the answer is? God is a person, obviously. Three persons, right? So he has personal feelings. Wouldn't a person, and isn't it very personal, where you would like your children to make requests for you, your wife, your loving uh, person to make requests for you? See? And then we love them in return, and we give it to them. That's called a loving relationship. It's called being a father. Yeah. It's called being a father. Sometimes children want something that the father feels uncomfortable about, but because they love the child, they'll give it to the child. That does happen. Why? Be and sometimes you give in to what your uh, lover wants, right? Even though you don't want to do it. Why? It's called being loving. It's called a healthy relationship. If that person does everything that you want to do, then see what you're doing? <laughs> So God wants that personal relationship going on. He wants to be a father. Well, I don't believe that. God is, can do whatever he wants. Yeah, let him do whatever he wants. He, what he wants is the spouse and the people he loves, the children he loves, to also give the request to him. He loves that kind of relationship. Yeah even if there are times that he does not want to answer that prayer. But there were times he did anyway, didn't he? And we learned our lesson from that, and we're like, man, I should have just done it what God wanted. That's right, no, sir. Now, why does God let those things happen? Because he likes for you to learn. Yeah. He likes for you to see. And it's called personal. It's a very personal relationship. <laughs> not a controlling relationship. See, controlling relationship... What are you trying to make God? <laughs> okay, uh, the privilege of prayer. Uh, God can let prayer change His plans. That's Numbers 14, 11 through 12. Numbers 14, uh, 11 through 12. Uh, and then don't forget 19 through 20. 19 through 20. So there are four verses there in Numbers 14. The second one is God can let prayer change his punishment. God can let prayers change his punishment. Jonah 3, 9 through 10. Jonah 3, 9 through 10. God can let prayer change his giving. God can let prayer change his giving. In other words, you can give, he can give more to you if you ask him. Wow. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? God can let prayer change his timing of life. God can let prayer change his uh, timing of life. And here's a good one. God can prevent prayer from changing his will. 
God can prevent prayer from changing His will. Oh, that's contradictory. Again, stop saying that, okay? You're too simplistic, okay? It's not contradictory, it's holistic. It's a full perspective. It's called being personal. You know why? People do this too. Sometimes people will say, no, your request must follow what I want, so I'm not going to let you do that. And there are times that they will give in. It's called being a person. Now, God is three persons, okay? Let's triple that, shall we? <laughs> For smart people, they can be very dumb. For smart people, they can be very dumb. Scope of sovereignty. That's the last section. Scope of sovereignty. So, we have demonstrated how God is still sovereign. He is still on the throne. He, oh, oh, what just happened there? All right. He's still on the throne in spite of things that are going on. We've demonstrated that. In spite of suffering occurring, in spite of man's free choice of sin, and other scenarios going on. And then he is still on the throne. He is still in charge. He ordained things to occur this way, including changes, yeah. including how he established personal relationships. You don't tell God what to do, Mr. Calvinist. Your Calvinism is a disgrace and blasphemy against the sovereignty of God of how he established and ordained things so that he can develop the relationship and the interaction that he wants with his creation. And that's for his glory. Amen. So shut your stinking Calvinist mouth. And don't disgrace what he has ordained. It's blasphemy. It's heresy. It's not just, oh, we're brothers in Christ and this is a minor doctrine. No, it's blasphemy. It's horrible what you've done to God. All right. A scope of sovereignty. Luke 22, 22. Let's turn to Luke chapter 22, and we'll look at verse 22. We'll only look at a few verses for time's sake. Luke 22, 22. There are times that uh, God's sovereignty will determine the event to occur, to occur. There are times that God's sovereignty will determine the event to occur. What i like to show you from this last picture is you see two cases, a Christian who lives in God's will, but then a Christian who doesn't care about God's will and wants something for himself. And in this example is healing. You'll notice that within God's will, if a Christian lives in that, he gets all the good things that happen. Peace, purity, safety, provision, joy, including good health at times. But then when you look at the other side, if a Christian decides not to follow God's will, so see, free will at play. Then what happens is you get no peace, you get no purity, you get no safety, but you'll get the thing that you want. Now, which one do you want? Your benefit or the full benefit? That's good. Your benefit or the full benefit? That's something to think and pray about. All right. So, in his scope of sovereignty, if we were to let him be sovereign God, we have to realize these are the things that can happen. And you can better understand his nature. So stop questioning how God does things and get upset at him. You need to know his nature, who he is. You know how you establish a better relationship with the person you love? You accept who they are. Amen. You accept their nature. God's already understanding of your nature. You need to work on understanding him. Okay, Luke 22, 22. Notice right here that the word of God says... And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So notice right here, this event will occur no matter what. Where someone will betray him and he will die on the cross. Calvinists wrongly assume that, see, God forced Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. No, it's the event, not the free choice of Judas. The event of betrayal. Look, there are so many sinners committing free will of sin. God can find... 100 to 200 Judas Iscariots there to betray him. It's not that hard. 
<laughs> See, I mean, Calvinists, they complicate everything when it's so simple. All right, the next one is Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. There are times that God's sovereignty will hide the answers from the saints. There are times that God's sovereignty will hide the answers from the saints. Well, God, if you would reveal it to me more, then I would understand better, and God's not obligated. You know why? Sometimes a parent doesn't say the whole story to their children either for very good reason. And if you don't understand that, you don't know what responsibility is over people you're in charge of or people that you love. Okay? All right, now, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Sometimes if you know it, it'll do you more harm than good. You want God... Uh, use common sense. Do you want God to show you everything that you want an answer for? Sometimes what we complain about, you have to ask, stop and ask yourself this. Oh God, why didn't... If you would only show me a little bit more, then I would better serve you. Stop and think a moment. Do you really want God to show you? Oh God, if you would answer this prayer, then this good thing I can do for you. Stop and think for a moment. Do you really want God to answer that prayer for you? See, you don't understand his nature. That's your problem, man. You know, I could... Uh, let me preach a Calvinist sermon on his sovereignty. <laughs> man, you sure got a problem in your flesh, huh? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So notice right here that, yes, we do get things that are revealed, but, see, the things that are revealed. Not everything. The verse point out there are some things that God keeps secret, other things He reveals. That's the bottom line. First, uh, the third one, write the verse down for time's sake. Write the verse down. First Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3. First Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3. The third thing is there are times that God's sovereignty will command men to serve Him, yet cannot force it. There are times that God's sovereignty will command to serve Him, yet cannot force it. So, you'll notice right here that in this case of sovereignty, he wants to give a command and wants you to follow it. But at the same time, what he wants is your free will to comply with what he ordains you to do. See, that sovereignty is a lot more deeper than you think, Mr. Calvinist. It ain't simple like, God can do whatever He wants, so everything that you go do has to align and follow everything that He wants. It's, it's not that simple, stupid, all right? See, we just got deeper than you Calvinists, okay? You want me to complicate sovereignty? Here's a complicated thing that you should understand. The sovereignty of God can be complicated where He can ordain you to do something, yet He ordains you for your free choice choice to comply with it. You want an easy example? Stop thinking. Now here's the simplicity of that complication. All right? You are in charge over your home and you tell your kids to do something, but you're not going but you're not you're not going to hire a scientist to remove half of your child's brain and then put a half a brain in there that's going to follow whatever you want to do. You want that child's brain to retain its own brain. Free choice. You know what I want in this church? This is simple. You want an easier example? As a pastor, when I tell this church to do things, I want the church members to follow it out of their free choice and their heart and their desire to do so. Is that so hard to understand about sovereignty? Come on, fool. This is real life personal scenarios. Okay, now anyway, uh, the fourth one is Deuteronomy 5.29. The fourth one is Deuteronomy 5.29. There are times that God's sovereignty will not interfere with men's hearts, no matter how much He desires them to serve Him. There are times that God's sovereignty will not interfere with men's hearts, no matter how much He desires them to serve Him. All right, the fifth one is Jeremiah 18.8. Jeremiah 18.8. There are times that God's sovereignty will be changed depending on His considerations. There are times that God's sovereignty can be changed 
depending on his uh, considerations. So here's one example right here. Here's a situation where God offered the Jews a chance where they will be able to be saved from the evil that he planned to do against them. Notice right here, Jeremiah 18, 8, if that nation against whom I have pronounced, see that? He ordained it. He pronounced it for the judgment to occur. Turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. See that? He pre-thought it. He foreordained it. And then he, uh, he had foreknowledge and everything, whatever. But the point is, is that this can be changed. Why? It's called being a person. You know what the simplest way to debunk Calvinist arguments is? Be a little bit more personal. Was that deep? That's deep. Maybe you only need five years to think about that. All right? And to refle and write reflection essays, Calvinists. Because you love to write essays, don't you? Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been eye-opening to our people. Made us respect who you are, Father. Made us respect who you are. And give you the glory that you deserve. And not criticize it. Not question it. And not complain against it. But let you be who you are and to have faith that what you do, that when your sovereignty is at play, it's for our best. Help us to truly understand who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.